Omaha's news leader, chronicling the stories and people making a difference in our community. This is KETV News Watch 7's Chronicle. Yeah, the music, the energy, the excitement means just one thing. The holidays have arrived and around here and across the country, Mannheim Steamroller is synonymous with the season. Good morning, everyone. I'm Rob McCartney. Today, we're going to give you a rare glimpse inside the studio where the magic happens before the bands go on tour. That's right, bands. Plus, my one-on-one -on -one interview with the man behind the music, Chip Davis. First, did you know Mannheim Steamroller has sold more than 40 million albums and have two of the top five Christmas albums of all time? In fact, since 1984, the band has traveled more than 27 million miles for its annual Christmas tour. There are actually two bands, and we sat in on one of their practices before they hit the road. Now the two touring companies leave town in early November, travel through New Year's Eve. And I asked Chip Davis what's different this year from previous years. So the material is partly Christmas, but at the request of many fans the last few years, they've asked for Fresh Air to be put back in it, which is the first album project I did. And I have eight Fresh Air albums. So there's a mix of Christmas and also Fresh Air. So you're fresh air all the way back from 75? Yes. Nice. Mm -hmm. So Chocolate fudge, in fact, track one is in the show. <laughs> well, will Convoy make it? Uh, uh, Convoy isn't going to be in this one, but we can work it in somewhere. <laughs> now, what, tell me what it's like on tour. I mean, you've been doing this for X number of years now. Well, I mean, I don't tour with the bands uh, like what they do today. They're on these really fancy touring buses, and uh, I mean, they've got Wi-Fi and you know, video and all kinds of stuff. They're really, really outfitted very nicely, the bunks and everything. But they play night after night. I mean, they have to have a really good environment to keep their energy levels up. But um, when I was touring with, uh, with the bands, it was, it was a completely different thing. I was taking, it was one band, and I was taking the core band around on just commercial flights. The scary part of that was you're stuck in Denver, a snowstorm hits, and you've got shows in the next market and you can't get out. So that started to have to change anyway. Right. Let's talk a little bit about Mannheim's history. You all started in 75. You started in 75, right? Mm -hmm. Basically, you defined a genre. Uh, do you agree with that? Yeah, pretty much. I, I, the, um, before then, uh, there hadn't been anything like what I consider to be a mixture of classical and pop or rock and roll elements. Before that, it was either one or the other. And initially, like in 74, 75, 76, in that area, um, people were either one way or the other. So this found a unique niche, and I developed an audience through hi-fi stores. It got to start actually being used as demonstration records. How did you, how did you even get your foot in the door? I mean, were, were people closing the door on you? I mean, how did you, did you just pound the pavement? A little bit of both. I mean, some of it we were going around, uh, a couple of buddies and I were going around with a trunk full of records and going around and selling them to different places and, and that sort of thing. But I mean, it, it, was a, it wasn't a matter of really getting our foot in the door as much as it was like trying to get more exposure in actual record stores like say Homer's or you know uh, some of the places locally here. And it all started locally here and gradually spread out till ultimately the big coup came for us when in 1984, 10 years later, when Target picked up the Chris, first Christmas album. And that really opened, that opened the doors a lot. <clears throat> and let's talk, you mentioned the Christmas album. That really, I mean, you, we were popular before then, wildly popular when the Christmas albums came out, the first one. Um, how did that change things for you? Well, the first thing that happened was People in the record industry said, Chip, don't write a Christmas album. 
because you could make a misconception that you're out of ideas. And uh, you know, you, so you're gonna just, a lot of times an artist would fulfill their contract by just throwing in a Christmas album so he could move on to another record label. I said, well, you know what? I just happen to like Christmas music and I particularly like the origin of Christmas music, which is from the Renaissance. So in that first Christmas album, there's a section in there about four pieces played on Renaissance instruments in the style that the songs would have been in their time frame. Mm -hmm. Do you want to make another one? Yeah, why not? You know, I've got a, I have the repertoire picked for a Christmas six, because I've got five right now. And uh, but with, with our, you know, we've got some uh, compilations and all that. We probably have eight to ten right now. But I do have the repertoire picked for a Christmas six, and I've always been careful not to step on our own toes. I mean, you only have five weeks to sell those albums. And if you come with them too soon, you'll just blow away the sales of the one before it. So it's a whole marketing structure, and that's how you're doing your tour as well, then, right? Yes, absolutely. Um, exotic Spaces? Yeah. Is that, is that out? Is that coming out? Just coming out. Yeah, tell me a little bit about this. Well, Exotic Spaces is, um, if there were, were to be a Fresh Air 9, it would be Fresh Air 9. So it's in the mentality, not style-wise, but mentality of a Fresh Air album. Uh, exotic Spaces explores places like the Taj Mahal, the pyramids, and I use, by the way, the indigenous instruments from those countries. The, I think the uh, coolest one is I recorded with some hydrophones the, the whale songs. And I took the songs of the whale and actually back scored it on the keyboards and based the, the key and everything on the whales and then played the music of Mannheim in behind the whales. But I didn't change the whales. They're in their own phrasing and everything. So the whales are your lead singers? Exactly. So to speak? Okay. That's exactly it. When do we see the exotic spaces? Uh, it's coming out now as well. In fact, we might have just released it uh, along with this new book release I've got. So. And you mentioned the book, the perfect segue. Tell yeah. me about the, the trilogy. Ah, uh, yeah, the trilogy is called The Wolf and the Warlander. And it's about a real wolf that lives on my farm named Satie and uh, a warlander horse named Ghost. And um, so, they're both eight years old now, and they played together as when they were born. And um, as they were playing, I started to wonder, to imagine, what on earth are they thinking when they're chasing through the pastures? And you can see it actually on the cover here, where they're they're running. Right. And Ghost is chasing Seti, and I wondered what you know what on earth is going on through their minds. That was the impetus for doing these stories, was trying to come up with like imaginary things of what they would think. But then that wasn't enough to do, so I needed some backstory. So I went back to where, you know, the, the, the origin of Ghost the Horse is a Frisian horse, which is a big draft horse from northern Germany. And I have been taken with a cart and a draft horse like that to Neuschwanstein Castle, which is where Wagner was the composer. So I imagine this whole thing as uh, imagining Wagner being taken to work to do a concert at Neuschwanstein by one of these Frisian horses. So that, that's where the backstory, actually the story starts there. Mad Ludwig's castle, right? That's it. Neuschwanstein, yeah, mm -hmm. that's nice. Um, why, is, was it really truly just I wonder what the animals are thinking or have you always wanted to be an author? No, I just wonder what they're thinking, but this is my 10th book, so it's not, yeah. So, I mean, we've, I've done this before. The first book I did actually made New York Times bestseller list. It was called A Night to Remember. It was about, it was a Christmas story. It's Christmas Angel as well. So. Christmas Angel, yeah. Mm -hmm. Let me, talk to me a little bit about your other, um, I don't say, endeavors with Mannheim. I'm, you have a whole entire food. <laughs> to, <laughs> tell me about this. I mean, you got all the sauces and everything. So. Well, the largest non-selling, or the, I'm sorry, the largest non-music product that sells is my cinnamon hot chocolate. And I think we're north of 80 tons right now in sales. We, we don't measure those in dollars like we do with records, we measure them in tons. And um, it's, the cinnamon hot chocolate this season, I mean, is, it, it, it goes great on the shelves around in the Midwest where people are familiar with Mannheim. So you, but that's not the only thing you have. I mean, there's your sauces too, and tell me about yes. all those. Uh, Bry is uh, the main sauce that's a spray. It's a basting, uh, but instead of using a brush and having the mess of a brush, 
I got these spray bottles and put it in spray bottles. And so when you're cooking on the grill, you can just spray it on. You don't have any mess left over. Um, it's made up of like soy, Worcestershire, sesame oil, and some nice and garlic and some other seasonings. And there's, a, uh, there's an original, and then there's a Cajun, which is hot, and then there's a, a mesquite. So it's, there's three flavors of the bry, and the original actually does sell the best. And uh, it's, it's usable, particularly good on chicken, steaks, I mean, anything, vegetables, you, anything you do on the grill. Are you a chef? I love to cook, yeah. Is, is it just creating? Is that what you like doing? Yeah, absolutely. Yeah, it's like it doesn't matter whether I'm doing music, books, or food. You know, they're, they all come from pretty much the same place, although the genesis of all of it comes from my music. But I do love creating. And the creativity never stops. Neither does the music. And I asked Davis about the music he's produced for other holidays. Christmas isn't the only fun season. And actually, there are four, uh, I've got four mainstays. There's a Halloween, there's a Christmas, there's Valentine's Day, in which I have uh, two or three albums of just romantic music. And then I've got Summer, and um, I did a very patriotic album in which I use like the Chicago Symphonic Choir singing my eyes have seen the glory and I mean I like to try to touch on the fabric of American life. And up next find out how Davis is using the magic of music for healing. You're watching KTV News Watch 7's Chronicle. Welcome back to KATV News Watch 7's Chronicle this morning, talking with the founder of Mannheim Steamroller, Chip Davis. We talked about his Christmas concerts and the band he made famous. Davis is one of those people who hears music everywhere, whether it's at his farm in Ponca Hills, the deserts of the American Southwest, or the ocean. He has created several albums tapping into those harmonies and in the process discovered a whole new purpose for his music. We all have a particular chord that resonates with nature. It's just built into us. And so it's a way to sort of reach in there and um, be able to guide your emotions around with that. And it's done primarily with natural sounds. And I've recorded, initially I started recording them on my farm up here in Ponca Hills. And we recorded with four microphones and <clears throat> re recorded surround sound environment. And I just started off doing that originally for home theaters, not knowing that it was going to end up being used in the medical field. Mm -hmm. But I started doing it just for that particular purpose. Once I got doing the Midwest and I ran out of seasons, I thought, okay, there's got to be, what else am I going to do? Mm -hmm. Went to the deserts in Tucson and we started recording the sounds of deserts in the daytime and in the nighttime. Um, then kind of got all that I could. And so we went to the West Coast and went up by Haystack Rock and started recording the sounds of waves crashing and all of that. So, you know, there are some water feature issues with it that, you know, that bring a whole different color to it. So the music that I write with that is completely different. Although I want to point out the music is not the important part. The nature is. So the music comes in and goes out. It's not, it's not a predominant part at all. And it is being actually being used, in, I understand, in Mayo yes. and other medical facilities. Mm -hmm. Update me that. Uh, update me. Where are we now with this in the medical aspect? Well, it's in the Mayos, as, as you mentioned, and some of the places they use it are in rehab rooms and some actually are in the ORs. Um, not for the patients, because the patients are knocked out, but for the doctors that are there doing long, like nine-hour heart surgeries mm -hmm. and things. Um, it's at Wake Forest. Uh, it's, you know, it's at an, I think we have 96 hospital rooms currently going and we're just about to put in a new system over here at the Buffett Cancer Center. I think we're, we're just doing the lobby right now so that when people come in, they're walking into nature in the Thule Garden, I believe. Are you still looking at, I know when we talked before, it was if you took some of the sounds of nature, it would relax people maybe people who have suffering from Alzheimer's or panic, anxiety, or whatever, it would help calm that part of their brain. Is that still a theory? Yes, absolutely. Um, because then, uh, some of the side benefits of that is not only just calming the people down, but like, you know, when they're, they're in a fairly long hospital stay, there's a lot of noise in hospitals, and so it's difficult for people to get rest. And we can overcome that with the nature sounds because you kind of tune those in, tune the others out. So it still is a very viable thing from 
just calming people down. Another wonderful benefit was that we saw that they are able to use less drugs than they might be when they're more uh, hyper uh, strong. Mm -hmm. And uh, with the, uh, when they calm down, they don't need to use as much. Was unintended benefit there? Yes, I mean, it's just, we literally discovered this stuff as, as I went. I just was trying to help people feel better and, uh, and it had some nice benefits though to the side. So you've got all this, you've got the ambient therapy, you've got uh, the food, you've got the books, oh yeah, you've got the bands. Uh, what, what, how do you separate your day? I mean, what, what's your, how, do you, how do you balance it all? Is there more than one Chip Davis? Um, no, but it's just, you know, when, when you list them all out, it sounds overwhelming, but I'm not doing them all at once. You know, I'm doing some for a while, and then I may leave it or decide to finish one ambient therapy CDs and just get that done, put it away. But then I go on to something else. I think that helps keep it fresh because I never really get to the point where I'm like, oh, I'm really tired of this now. Right, right. Do you ever get involved with sports stuff? Um, yeah, some. I mean, um, not from directly in a sports way, but um, I played for uh, Coach Osborne's uh, retirement party oh. over there. And um, uh, when they wanted to do, they, they didn't, they didn't have actually an alma mater, they had the fight song, but they didn't have an alma mater. And so the chancellor, uh, who was chancellor at the time, James Meeser and I wrote that together. And then we performed it with the combined bands, choirs, everybody, and Mannheim Steamroller on flatbed trailer right in the middle of the 50 yard line. And we performed that at the stadium. And that was a, just a thrill to be able to do that. Right, right. What's next for Mannheim Steamroller? How long will Mannheim be on track, so to speak? You know, now that I've taken myself out of the band, as long as we can keep doing it, you know, I mean, I've got enough material that we haven't used that we can probably do it in easily another 10 years. Mm -hmm. And then there's the whole NASA connection. I mean, we did, we did concerts uh, with NASA to raise awareness about the, some of the great benefits that happened in space as a result of NASA. And, um, you know, of course, there's the ambient therapy, there's the food products. I think they all evolve around the same basic desire just to create. Mm -hmm. And I mean, the, the medical stuff, I have to say, I grew up in a farm town of 500 people in Ohio, northern Ohio. And my grandfather was a country doctor, and my grandmother was a music teacher. And I think those two elements, I was exposed to those every day growing up as a kid. And I think that's where the music and the medicine come from. And that was, that one, I wanted to ask you, where does the creativity, is it something where you say, I'm gonna sit down and work for six hours today creating, or is it, I have an idea in the middle of the night, I'm gonna pop up and write this thing down. Both, um, when I was a jingle writer, writing commercial music, mm -hmm. uh, I didn't have the luxury of like, I think I'll write this when I have some inspiration. And it's like, now, hey Chip, did you wanna get paid? <laughs> <laughs> right, right, right. <clears throat> so um, I had to write on the spot. And um, you know, I mean, I go meet with a client or the agency, and they say, we want this style, we want it to be like this best training ground for any young composers out there is have to write music on demand and in different styles because I had to learn a lot of stuff. I, I grew up as a classical musician mm -hmm. and so I had to learn a lot about a lot of different styles to be able to do that and it was a fabulous training ground as a young composer. Advice for anybody out there, someone who may have, who says I'm a creative person, I want to do something and I have a lot of energy and what are my outlets, what should I do in this day and age? Number one, believe in yourself and don't let people tell you that you think out of the box because there isn't any box. And just keep doing it? Just do it. And how does Chip Davis want to be remembered? Find out when KATV News Watch 7's Chronicle continues. First though, a reminder, your comments, they're an important part of the show. If you want to be heard, email us, news at KETV.com. Oh, you know, there's times when I still get nervous and, you know, I don't, my knees don't turn to jelly, but, you know, um, you know, the old saying, you're only as good as your last newspaper headline. 
And so when I walk out on the stage, and if I'm actually performing or like doing the universal stuff where I'm conducting an orchestra and all that, you know, you goof up and people remember that a lot more than the last 10, 10 good ones that you had. It seems like, I mean, maybe they don't, but, but it does always worry a little bit if, if you goof up. That's yeah, Mannheim Steamroller founder Chip Davis talking about what makes him nervous even after the thousands of times he's performed. We spent the past 30 minutes talking with him about the band, his books, the future. We also asked him about his legacy. I guess um, I would like people to go, this guy, Chip Davis, that lived back in that time frame, came up with a completely different genre of music and crossed a lot of boundaries, a lot of ages, put together grandparents, parents, children, everything, all kinds of demographics and was able to reach inside of people and maybe light a fire in them. And so in 50 years from now or 100 years from now, it would be neat to be remembered as sort of a, a composer that really made a difference. The most important thing for me that I'd like to do is to continue just doing what I'm doing. I mean, I'm blessed with having these wonderful areas of creativity that are open. I have a fabulous staff here that knows how to sell them and help me market them just continuing on with new things. I mean, after exotic spaces, there's gonna be something else. I don't know what yet, but when I can get to it, that's something I'd like to be able to just do, continue on with being creative and giving people things that are meaningful. Why do you stay in Omaha? Why not? Well, I mean, you could go anywhere. You've got houses all over the place. You could, <laughs> you could be closer to large media outlets. Is that oh, important? Oh, yeah, I'm, yeah I'm, I'm like a nature kid, you know I mean? like. I'm not a concrete jungle guy. I, you know, like I say, I live on a 150 acre farm up here in Ponca Hills and I love tooling around out in my woods on my golf carts and doing that sort of thing. And that's where my wolves live, my horses, you know, my kids are out there quite often visiting and hanging out. And yeah, I'm, I'm all about nature and doing that sort of thing. So yeah, I'm not, if I, like when we play Macy's Parade and do those kind of big market things, I mean, it's great, it's fabulous visibility and everything, but a $35 hamburger isn't my cup of tea at, in, the, in the hotel. So, I mean, I'm thrilled to have the opportunity to do that, but on the other hand, I'm very thrilled to come back home to Nebraska. I think you just spoke for 99% of the people in this area. <laughs> Good. Oh, well, there, there, there ain't no place like Nebraska. No, there you go. It's, it's not for everybody. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> that's right. Do you, you like being an icon? You know, I'm trying to figure out which icon I am. Am I that little steamroller icon that goes? <laughs> <laughs> you could be, no. No, of Nebraska. I mean, you say the big names, the high holy names of Nebraska. I mean, you're right up there. Well, if I am, it's an honor. And I'm thrilled to death to be in that, in that uh, company. There's some tremendous people in this state. And if, if I'm thought of in that way, I'm grateful. Remember, if you missed any part of the show, it's online right now at KETV.com. Just go to our homepage, click on the menu button, and look for Chronicle. I'm Rob McCartney. we we'll leave you this morning with more of Mannheim Steamrollers' practice session before they went on this year's tour.